as Christian women, we know that one of the greatest calls on our life is not only to love God himself, but also to love others and to be a good neighbor. But how do we do that? How do we form relationships with people who think differently than us? How do we be in a relationship with people who have different values than we have? How do we love others? Well, today on the Equipping Godly Women podcast, we're talking to Lauren Casper, author of the book, Loving Well in a Broken World, Discovering the Hidden Power of Empathy. In this podcast, we're discussing how do I love others? What does that look like, practically speaking? And how can I do that in a way that doesn't jeopardize my own faith and family? So if that's a topic that you are interested in learning more about, I definitely hope you'll stay tuned. All right. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thanks for having me. Can you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your story and why this book's topic was so important to you personally? So the the quick version um, is I have been married to my husband for almost 15 years. Um, we have two kids. They are seven and nine. And I have been writing online for 11 years, and over the last four years now, I've written two books. And so this book, um, my, this is my second book, Loving Well in a Broken World, um, was sort of born over the last few years of just the place um, I find society in right now, or maybe just that I am being more aware of the... Uh, brokenness of the world and then as my kids are getting older talking to them about things they're dealing with at school and seeing a lot of parallels between the playground and the adult world and as I'm talking to them and and hopefully teaching them about what it looks like to um, be a good person a good neighbor in this world um, realizing wow a lot of us grown-ups need um, these reminders as well, and it could help as we navigate sort of the chaos of today. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially lately with our political climate the way it is, and I don't know if it's just that I've been following different people online or what, but it just seems like there's so much divisiveness and so much like us against them um, and really not what we see in the gospel when we're supposed to love our neighbor. Um, so I'm really excited to dive into this topic and to talk more about, okay, what does that actually look like on a really practical level? Um, but I know in your book, you talk specifically about um, the power of empathy. This is a word that I'm sure most of us have heard of, like we're somewhat familiar with, but can you tell us a little bit more like what is empathy specifically? What does it look like? Like, just fill us in um, on anything we would need to know about that. Sure. Well, empathy is um, really just simply seeing another person um, and understand. It's seeing, understanding, and feeling. So seeing somebody else um, and what they're going through, understanding the cause of it. Um, typically, when we talk about empathy, we're talking about hard things. So seeing someone in their pain understanding the cause of that pain, and then um, feeling with them, joining them in that so that it can propel us into action, into loving them well. So empathy has a purpose. It's not just to uh, spread pain and everybody all be in pain because we're all feeling what everybody else is feeling all the time and just drowning in it. Its purpose is to propel us into the lives of others um, into the action of loving and um, and into community, really, because that's the ultimate. The difference between sympathy and empathy is the joining. Um, sympathy is more detached. It's feeling bad for somebody else rather than feeling bad with somebody else. Um, and so the empathy propels us to action, whereas sympathy does not. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for explaining it that way, because I think that's such an important distinction um, because it's so easy to like feel bad for, oh, there's people out there who deal with stuff and know that stinks. Um, but actually to be able to have empathy with them and to join in their story with them to the degree that we can um, 
is just a whole different level. Right. So I want to ask you in your book, you talk about how we can identify kind of our blind spots. And I think this is so important because how many times like we see people around us every day and how many of them are struggling with things and going through things and we have no idea because kind of our cultural default is oh i'm fine i'm good as long as i'm not like totally falling apart like it's fine um so how can we kind of identify some of these blind spots or kind of pick up on the things that we're missing does this mean simply just opening our eyes and paying more attention and asking questions of the people we see every day or does this mean like intentionally going out and researching like what are the problems in this area of the world or what are the issues that these specific people so we are going out and like okay i want to know more about this topic i want to know this topic um what does that kind of look like I think it's both. Um, I think that we need to be intentional about um, our own neighborhood, sort of specifically, literally, where we live locally, um, and that our friend groups, our families, I think we need to be intentional about paying attention, keeping our eyes open. Um, and like you said, our default is to, you know, how are you? Fine. Even if your world's falling apart, <laughs> you know. So um, I think uh, another thing I talk about in the book, blind spots is one chapter and being vulnerable is another chapter because it frees other people up to be vulnerable with us. And so that helps break down those blind spots when we are opening ourselves up. It gives other people permission to open up to us. It's not just a one-way street where somebody's pouring their heart out to us and we're listening and not sharing with them. It, it leads to an unequal power dynamic. Um, when we do that. And so we need to be brave ourselves and be vulnerable and open up to others to give them that freedom, that permission to do the same with us. So I think um, in our own day-to-day -day context, in our own lives, I think it is a lot of just paying attention. I also think it's um, when we hear something that we don't initially understand, when we're presented with a reality that maybe doesn't seem like reality to us, that instead of um, maybe following what we would like to do, which is be dismissive, like, oh, that's not true. Well, that's not been my experience, to look deeper and go, hmm, I wonder why that person's saying that. And if it's a person face-to-face -face asking them, that's interesting. Can you tell me more about that? Can you tell me more about your experience with that? And being open to having our minds changed because so often we just get a narrative in our minds about what the world is like based on our own experiences. And we are open to having our minds changed by someone else who's lived a completely different reality. Um, and, you know, as for all human beings, we are the center of our own worlds. So it makes sense why our own experiences we would just assume are universal, but they're not. And so um, if we can understand that and keep that at the forefront of our mind that my experience is valid because it is my experience, but the person sitting across from me has an equally valid experience, even if it's completely different from mine. Um, so I think in our day-to-day -day context, um, that's one way to combat blind spots. And then the other side of it that you mentioned, um, sort of more globally, nationally, globally, not in our neighborhood or town or city, um, I do I do think it's important to be aware of what's going on and to um, do our research and look further when we don't know a lot about something. So if there's a major issue in the world that we're going, I just don't know much about that, but it seems to be a big problem. I think that as um, Christians that want to be good neighbors, we have a responsibility to look into that. Now, I do know that there's a lot going on in the world and we'll get burned out if we are spending all day, every day researching every possible topic. So I, I do understand that that is not possible to be an expert in everything. But I think... Um, as we are presented things and as we are keeping our eyes and our ears open to the world around us, it kind of becomes obvious when you're like, hmm, I don't know a lot about that. I should look into what's going on there. Um, it doesn't mean we necessarily have to go looking for every detail. Yeah, absolutely. And I've experienced that too, where if I'm, you know, on 
different websites and it can be a bit overwhelming to see all the people complaining about all the problems and you're like, what can I possibly do right. about any of this? Um, but it is important to open our eyes a little bit to, you know, know other people have other opinions because they have different life experiences and to have those conversations. Right. Um, so another thing I wanted to ask you about was in your book, you talked about creating diverse relationships. Can you tell me a little bit about how we would actually do that? Um, is it just a matter of, oh, I don't have any friends with this color skin, so I need to go find somebody? Or you know, how do you actually find good people to be friends with if you are kind of in a little bit of a bubble where you only hang out with people who are just like you? So yeah, I think that um, as far as creating relationships with all sorts of people, that takes effort and in being intentional. Um, I'm I'm not sure that it necessarily looks like going out specifically to find certain friends and meet a quota of you know your diversity math or whatever. Um, but I do think it looks like looking inside your bubble. What what is what is this community I have created um, and why? And is it that I, um, for example, I'll give you a little um, snapshot of, of my life. Um, I am a sort of middle class uh, white mom and with two elementary school kids. I work from home and uh, my husband works full time and, you know, we're Christians. We go to church on Sunday. So it's really easy for my bubble to be Christian moms. And based on where I live, it's really easy for that to be white Christian moms who are about middle class. Um, and to step outside that bubble means that I need to go other places. So often it's based on where we spend our time. So if all our time is spent at home in a neighborhood with other middle class people if that's where we live and at church then it makes sense that the people we spend time with are going to be other people that look and have experiences just like us um and so are we spend are we reaching out and spending time with other moms at the playground um that might not be in our socioeconomic class or might not be christians are we going to other events and spending time um, other places that aren't necessarily church events or school events. I think it just takes a little bit of effort. And um, I live in a really small city, so um, it's easy to know what's going on around me because there's not a lot going on around me all the time. So it's easier for me to step out and find those things. But I think even if you live in a big city, there's probably even more opportunity um, might just be a little bit m more difficult to figure out what's, you know, what's going on at any given time if there's so much going on. But I think it's just stepping, being the one to step out of our bubble. Um, look at what's going on around us. What are some projects we can get involved in in our communities that might introduce us to people that we haven't met before? Um, it just takes some effort and being intentional about it. Um, but I think that it's worth it. Well, I'm sure that that can feel a little bit weird to go and put yourself in new activities and new situations that you have ever, that you've never done before. Um, and you might even get a little bit of pushback from your family, like, why do you want to go do this thing that people don't typically do? But I'm sure it's got to be so enriching and so good to just broaden your horizons and do new things. Um, but I want to ask you kind of along that line, when you start to step out of the typical, you know, this is what people like me do and to go put yourself in new situations um, and you're going outside of just church activities, how do you find a good balance between I know as a Christian, it is so important to, you know, the people who you surround yourself with are really going to affect you. And I talk all the time at Equipping Godly Women, like making sure that you have really strong Christians around you, because if you are surrounded by people who also their faith is their top priority, that's really going to rub off on you. So how do you go and have relationships with people who think differently, believe differently, vote differently, all the things? Um, that aren't just a mere representation of you. How do you do those without necessarily putting your faith in jeopardy um, or even putting your family in jeopardy? I know that, you know, is I don't want to be rude in that kind of thing, but I feel like that's something that so many of our listeners are going to want to know. Like, how do I go hang out with people I wouldn't necessarily hang out with without 
you know, obviously we want a good effect from that, but how do we kind of protect ourselves from some of the negative repercussions that could happen? Yeah, um, well, you know, I haven't really experienced any negative repercussions from that. I mean, I have very close friends who are Christians as well. Um, and, you know, like you were saying, keep me grounded in my faith. Um, and I gain a lot of encouragement from, I have very close friends who practice different faiths and I have close friends who, um, aren't really practicing in any sort of, um, organized religion. And they all enrich my lives in different ways, my life in different ways. Um, I think that what I have found is that my faith is strong and my God is good and big. And there is not, there hasn't been risk to me to reach out to others. Um, I don't think God designed us to stay in bubbles. And I think that he, he, um, he is with us no matter where we are, and so we don't need to be afraid. I think that's that's the thing is that God tells us not to be afraid. It's one of the most common things said in the Bible, um, to fear not. And I think in this in this particular um, instance, it's another place we can apply that to not be afraid. Um, I think, and I honestly believe that it's our fear that often keeps us separate from others and divided is that we are different. Human beings are different, um, different cultures, different societies, different, all, all the difference. There's endless list. Um, and we have become so afraid of our differences that then we've become afraid of each other and afraid that if we connect to each other, in spite of those differences, something bad's going to happen to us. We'll lose our faith or, um, you know, down the line. And what I have found is that it's only added to my life, not subtracted. Um, it hasn't taken anything away from my faith. In fact, my being friends with people of other faith groups has actually strengthened and enriched my faith. Um, and if that's a really beautiful thing. So that's been my experience. Of course, I can't speak to everyone in their experience but that's been what i've found and um and yeah so it's it's just to to not be afraid of our differences and obviously if you are in a place where you are really struggling um with your faith and you're not feeling you're questioning a lot and you feel like i just really need some encouragement from people in um, in, in my church right now, and I'm going through a really tough time. I don't think that there's anything wrong with um, really leaning closely on those people. I think that that is a wonderful thing, and that's something I've done throughout my life. Um, but I don't think we need to be afraid of other people either. That's a great perspective. How would you address, though, um, being friends with people who are actively sinning or making life choices that we don't necessarily agree with. How can we be in a relationship with them as a Christian? Does this mean that we need to just say, oh, well, that's fine for you and I don't believe in it, but you know, it doesn't matter. Or does it mean that we have to be telling them constantly like, hey, what you're doing is wrong and trying to evangelize them the whole time? You know, how can we find this balance of being in relationship with people when we clearly see like what you are doing is wrong and I don't agree with your lifestyle. Sure. Um, well, I think the key word there is relationship. So there's going to be people around us all the time and maybe we don't agree with the choices they're making, but if we don't have a relationship with them, um, I, I personally think it's not a great idea to say anything because th that's not going to be received very well if there's no relationship there. Um, so I, so I do think that that is the key word is, are you in a relationship with this person? Um, and what's the relationship like? Is this just an acquaintance? Is this someone that you're a really good friend with? And I think with good friends, there is, there is um, room for honesty. But in that, in that case, I think that it goes back to sort of the vulnerability thing and going both ways. There, if we're going to feel okay speaking into their lives and saying what we feel they should or shouldn't be doing, we also need to be okay to be on the receiving end of that. Um, and I, I tend to be very careful. Everyone has a different opinion about that. Um, I personally think that I love best when I leave that to the Lord. I don't really spend time evangelizing my friends um, constantly because 
um, it hasn't, it hasn't been something that I felt like, um, in, in the sense of telling them their lifestyle is wrong or the way that they're living is wrong. It hasn't been something that I felt like would be beneficial to either one of us or our relationship. Um, and in particular, I feel very convicted by the fact that um, I'm sinning every day and my sins might be tidier, shinier, or more hidden than maybe somebody else's sins, but that doesn't make it any less of a big deal. So I'm very aware of that and careful when I'm talking with other people um, that I pay a little bit more attention to the plank in my own eye than the speck in my brother or sister's eye. So that's just how I look at it and I know everybody has a little bit different idea and and it depends on your friendship I really think it de depends on the person in the friendship there's going to be people that that would destroy the friendship that would destroy um, any relationship or inroads you had there and there might be other people that um, maybe have a more blunt or bold personality that they would really welcome that and welcome being called out and your views um, and it also depends on the harm being done are you are you being harmed by um, something or somebody somebody else being harmed by your friend's actions and, and I think so there's I think it's a case-by-case -case basis but by and large just in general I found that I don't I don't really think that that's a necessary part of friendship and I've had friendships before in the past actually in high school one of my very good friends um, one of my best friends was an atheist and that was okay because she knew what I believed and I'm sure that there were times where I could share it with her but then I could also just be like you are awesome you know it's not my job like I will share the gospel I will share the truth and love but it's not my job to convert her that's God's job um, so I can do what I can but what I remember specifically was there was a day when I was making some kind of I don't even remember what it was, but some kind of bad choice. And she told me and she was like, hey, I know you're a Christian and this isn't how Christians behave. And we had a really close relationship where she could do that. But even when she wasn't a Christian, like she knew who I was and she knew what I stood for. And she was able to call me out and say, hey, like this isn't what you stand for. So even though she wasn't a Christian, like she was still doing that in my life as well. And I could also in her life be like, hey, you know, this is what I believe and why. And obviously you are a person can make your own decisions. But, you know, this is kind of where I'm coming from in my perspective. So to have those conversations and not to be scared of having those conversations when it's appropriate um, is a great way to kind of open that door and share with people. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. And I love that she knew you and knew that you would want that from her, you know, that you would want her to say, hey, I know this isn't who you are, and this is taking you down a different path. Um, I think that's really beautiful. That's a two-way street there. Well, I do need to um, wrap up this interview. I could talk to you so much more and ask you so many more questions. Um, but before I let you go, will you tell us a little bit about your book and your ministry? Um, basically, what do we need to know to hear more from you? Yeah, so my book um, is called Loving Well in a Broken World, Discover the Hidden Power of Empathy. Um, and that's really sums up what it's about. It is why it is sort of painting a picture of why empathy is so important in loving our neighbors. Um, it shows us how to love our neighbors well because we're all different. So we've all walked around in our own shoes for our whole lives. We know exactly what we need to feel loved and what, what, um, what would feel loving to us. But to understand what feels loving and what is loving to our neighbors requires empathy and understanding what life is like in walking around in their shoes. And so um, I kind of go through some of the things that hold us back from empathy, how we can cultivate empathy, why it's so important, what it looks like practically, and then what it what it can do in the world when we um, when we do cultivate and practice empathy. Um, and then, so yeah, so I'm excited about that. And then you can find me online. You reference my website. It's laurencasper.com. And from my website, you can find all my um, social media links. I'm on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And I think that's all. Yeah, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And my links are on my website. And so... Um, so yeah, it was so wonderful talking with you today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to record with me today. Thank you so much for having me. 
All right, so that just about does it for today's podcast episode. If you'd love to hear more from Lauren or check out her brand new book that is publishing February 18th, 2020, I would definitely encourage you to go look up her book. It is called Loving Well in a Broken World, and you can find it wherever books are sold. If you're watching this video on YouTube, I would love to have you join in on the discussion as well. Go ahead, leave us a comment down below. And as always, if you have not subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast, what are you waiting for? We regularly share interviews and information designed to help you grow in faith and family and be the amazing Christian woman God created you to be. So we definitely hope that you will subscribe and we'll see you again back here real soon. All right. Bye.